Uh, today's uh, uh, morning presentation is listed on your uh, on the uh, schedule as lines of evidence. Um, there we are. Um, my original plan for this is uh, was like this. Uh, Laurent and I uh, were afraid that we had been purely descriptive and hadn't attempted to be persuasive and that we should uh, sort of give you some idea why we think we're on the right track. I think to some extent we've already done that. That is, uh, there, uh, we have phenomena in uh, uh, word families uh, that uh, we're able to, a, a certain amount of the, uh, of the variation in shape of the forms and, and meaning, uh, we can uh, account for more or less with uh, hypotheses about what affixes do what and what the root is and so forth. Uh, so to the extent that we can connect uh, a large group of apparently related words by processes that we think we understand, that's already uh, 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 something. Um, there's also these cases of interlocking evidence. Basically that's uh, an important uh, clue, I think, if to when you're on the right track, um, we there's this prenasalization in Hmong Mien, and there are uh, there's a softened initials in Mien, and it, we, at least we have a way of uh, reconciling that evidence now with old Chinese reconstruction, and with the exception of uh, Starston's uh, attempt to include some Mien uh, data in his old Chinese reconstruction. Uh, uh, I don't think that that's simply never been done before in, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's not that people haven't used, uh, uh, occasionally used uh, evidence from uh, loan words and things like that, but certainly uh, I'm pretty sure even uh, Staristin did not attempt to, to deal with the softened initials. It was just uh, upper register uh, tones where you didn't expect them and a few things like that. Um, and the, also the, as I pointed out earlier, uh, most Chinese dialects have a uniform treatment of uh, what were originally voiced initial consonants or initial obstruents, uh, uh, the so-called chen zhuo yin, the fully muddy uh, sounds. And, um, uh, but in the Min dialects, uh, they c seem to come up uh, sometimes aspirated, they're, they're de-voiced, but they come up uh, sometimes as aspirated and sometimes as unaspirated. And uh, we think that, th and that I think uh, Starstein also included in the phonology. Uh, for us, it's a consequence of morphology because uh, uh, the aspirated ones are the ones that we believe were, had an M prefix, which protected them from the first round of devoicing. The first round of devoicing. Uh, in Min uh, gave you vo voiceless, unaspirated uh, uh, obstruents. And then uh, by the time, uh, then after a while, the, the M dropped away. And so you still had, uh, you had another set of vo voiced uh, initials from the ones that had had an M prefix. Uh, and then there was a second round of devoicing in which they were, uh, the voiced aspirates were uh, uh, sorry, the voiced obstruents came out as uh, voiceless aspirated, and that's a similar, that's the same change basically as what happened in the Gan dialects, that is the uh, uh, Jiangxi dialects and the uh, uh, Hakka dialects. Uh, so, uh, and as people have brought up uh, questions, we've uh, uh, tried to do that. So, I think I'm going to devote most of this morning to uh, to paleography and excavated texts to show you where some of the, uh, well, and again, this is an area where uh, we can test predictions. That, that is, our hypotheses make predictions. If we have two ways of writing a character, we can all often say, well, based on our uh, hypotheses, this one has to be the earlier character and this one the later character. And then we can check that. Uh, if uh, against texts that have already been excavated that we simply haven't looked at yet, or uh, texts that uh, are fresh out of the ground and which we had no, of course, had no opportunity to tamper with, 
to uh, make them fit our hypotheses. So that's one way of, of testing things. Um, so that's uh, so. On the one hand, we can test hypotheses against excavated texts. Uh, potentially, of course, uh, the excavated texts can tell us that we're wrong about something. That is, if, if it's in conflict with what we've predicted or what we've reconstru reconstructed, um, then we can. Uh, follow that to, uh, to revise the reconstruction. As far as I know, the main phenomena like that are the reconstructions of particular words. Uh, and it's a consequence of the fact that we have incomplete information. Uh, and so, if, well, if we were really doing it right, we'd incorporate all the possibilities we would, uh, could think of. And then when we found additional evidence in the excavated texts, that would help us narrow it down to a smaller set of possibilities. And that has also happened, and I'll give you a few examples of that. So we're getting new information that we didn't have before. It's not just a matter of, uh, of uh, testing uh, the predictions of the system, but also uh, solving problems in the system or making, uh, getting information where we had insufficient insu information before. Now, I'm a little bit, uh, I feel a little embarrassed because uh, some of what I'm going to show you, several of you uh, probably have already seen before. Um, b uh, two years ago, I gave a talk on excavated texts here. Um, and some of the slides come from that. Uh, and then actually, uh, at the Journée uh, last week, um, well, I think I went over the slides involved so quickly <laughs> that, that I, it's no harm in going over them again. Uh, if you've been to the Leiden workshop, then you probably may have seen these already twice before at least. So please uh, uh, have patience, but I don't think it hurts to take another look, having uh, maybe a clearer idea of what we're up to. Uh, but I also have new uh, uh, things about from excavated texts that I have uh, that are, we haven't presented before. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some of that. Some of that is in fairly rough form. So this is not as pretty a presentation. I'll be shifting back and forth among several documents. Uh, but uh, anyway, I hope it will give you an idea of the uh, possibilities of, uh, of the importance, actually, of paleography in doing this. And uh, also the, the fact that we often find confirmation for our ideas or additional information that's consistent with our ideas. Uh, from uh, excavated texts. Um, before I go on, let me say also that the, uh, well, I said, we said at the beginning that we thought this needed to be a group effort uh, to reconstruct Old Chinese. Carlgren tried to do everything himself. I don't know if he, I don't think he ever had his uh, uh, Sagar or Baxter by his side to uh, keep him honest or uh, get him on the right track. I, probably everybody around him was scared stiff. Um, so, um, <coughs> But uh, we, uh, certainly even the two of us together, um, uh, we're, neither of us is a, is a specialist in paleography. Neither of us knows the, uh, the early literature uh, in any way like many of the Chinese scholars who are working in this area who will you know, come across a passage and they say, oh, well, that's from chapter so-and-so of the Li Ji. It's just like that. Well, we're not in a position to do that either. Uh, but we... Uh, on the other hand, we, I think we are in a position to give uh, phonological advice to those people because, as I will show you, the system that is often used, when there is a system used at all, is uh, a very coarse-grained uh, uh, system, and it's, uh, it's not nearly uh, as precise as our reconstructions. So that's, uh, well, but... In, in the spirit of trying to get paleographers and old uh, Chinese uh, workers together, um, we're running, a, uh, I'm running in August, a workshop in Leiden, a two-week workshop. This is the third uh, annual one so far. But this one is focusing on uh, paleography, and we have invited, well, I'll be talking mostly the first week, but for the second week, we've invited uh, Chen Jian who uh, seems to be a very fine uh, 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 paleographer uh, from China to uh, um, help us run the second part, and we hope to have a kind of meeting of the minds. 
and I have, I think I've met Chen Jin briefly, but I don't really know him, but I'm told that he has all of this stuff off the top of his head. He can just say, oh yes, that occurs in such and such a bronze inscription from 750 BC and so forth. And so uh, so that's, that's what we, the kind of expertise that we really need. Okay, any questions before we go on? Okay, now, let's see. So let me talk a little bit about the background of Chinese paleography, and I'm going to show you sort of what the system looks like that many of them use, and I'll give you a few examples. So there's actually a very long tradition of paleography. You could take it back as far as the Shuo Wen Jie Zi, which uh, collected earlier uh, script, forms from the earlier script, as well as the script, uh, the small seal script, uh, which was already obsolete, more or less, by the time of the Shuo Wen in 100 uh, CE. Uh, there was another, well, there was a tomb that was excavated in the Wei dynasty, uh, which uh, caused a big stir in there uh, with old writing. And uh, uh, also there was a burst of interest in antiquities in the Song dynasty, so some of the initial work on bronze inscriptions classifying bronze vessels into different types and that kind of the terminology and so forth and some work on the inscriptions is was uh, done in the Song dynasty um, which is to say 11th 12th century something like that um, and uh, uh, I, I hasten to say that I don't know much about this Excuse yes me. can you uh, put something un under the uh, projector? Well, that's the bottom. Oh, let's see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Let's see. Or just... Yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's... It's a question of whether I will use uh, Judashi or Li Ling. <laughs> but uh, if I have to refer to the book, I'll do it later. Is that better? Okay. Okay. And it's a little bit... Hmm? <laughs> oh, the bottle. I can't, can't do it without my bottle. <clears throat> so, um, anyway, I, I hasten to add that I don't have a very thorough grasp of the history of this discipline any more than I have of the discipline itself. Uh, but also in uh, Qing scholars, also uh, the same Qing scholars that worked out the phonology, many, some of them uh, worked on uh, paleography as well. And of course, the oracle bones were discovered in 1899, I think the year usually is given, and uh, that also caused a great burst of activity. So uh, most, uh, if you go to a Chinese university to study Gu Wen uh then you are taught, one hopes uh, you are taught, but anyway, uh, uh, there is a framework which is taught in that situation, a traditional framework for deciding things like whether such and such a, wor a form could or could not be a representation of such and such a word or, or a loan character for such and such a word. And um, um, I mean, I say loan words, I mean loan characters here. Um, but it is somewhat unusual for people in that discipline to use any kind of modern style uh, linguistic reconstruction with actual uh, phonetic symbols. Uh, it is it is done. Uh, my impression is that when people do this, they usually use uh, uh, Li Fangui's system, which is not bad. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's pretty good. And after all, they can't use ours if it's not published, so I can hardly complain. Actually, the reason, one of the reasons that we decided to uh, um, to do this, go ahead and start releasing stuff before we were uh, really finished is because, first of all, we realized that uh, by the time we're finished, we would be dead. <clears throat> but uh, um, also, we were at a meeting, at, uh, Laura and I were at a meeting in Chicago a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I guess it was, and Cho Xi Gui was there. The whole meeting was held in Chinese, and uh, I showed some of the same stuff that I'm going to show you. So if you were that meet, at that meeting too, you, that'll be fourth or fifth time you've heard it, some of it. Um, and he said, uh, he seemed very uh, uh, interested and uh, 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 in fact in comments sort of uh, defended what I was saying against some criticisms uh, that were, another person had raised, but he said, 
Now, that's all very nice, but uh, unless you give us something we can use, you know, obviously we can't use it. We don't even have a list of words. If you could just give us a list of words with reconstructions, that would then we could begin to use it. But And I realize, uh, I mean, uh, Laurent and I are already old enough that Shoshi Gui is still older. And uh, uh, so, I mean, not to... Uh, bring on misfortune, but uh, we, we think it's a good idea to go ahead and, and get things out early. And of course, with reactions to that, more people will be checking to see whether these things work or not. So we'll have uh, presumably some feedback, hopefully some of it uh, friendly. <laughs> um, so the tr here's what I, the main thing, or the main things that I want to say about the traditional framework that I'll be describing. When it's used carefully, it's usually okay as far as it goes. That is, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't take you off in some wild direction. So it is a, it's a respectable in that way. Even when it's used carefully, however, it's still a very coarse-grained analysis that overlooks a lot of distinctions that we are, fair, are very confident existed. Now, for example, uh, uh, if we see a, a D initial, a voiced D initial in Middle Chinese, for us, that has uh, two possible origins. It could come from uh, uh, an old Chinese D, or, well, actually several possibilities, or it could be some prefix which led to a D, or it could be an L, because uh, Ls in type A also give you Middle Chinese D. Um, but uh, they do not make this distinction, and so sometimes they say, well, this has a Ding Mu, and this has Ding Mu, so they could be used for each other, but in, sometimes it's going to be the case that one of those has an L and the other has a D, and in fact that, that they aren't usually uh, interchanged, those are usually kept separate. So, so that's what I mean by saying that it's coarse-grained. Uh, that's when it's, people are doing it carefully, but not everyone is careful or explicit. Uh, I, can, I don't know if I'll get around to citing these examples, and I'm not sure if I'm going to name names or not, but the but it's very common for people to say, uh, just say, yin jin ke tung, right? Uh, the sounds are similar and so they can be used interchangeably and they don't explain why they consider the sounds uh, similar. Mm, sometimes it's on the basis of their own uh, dialect of modern Chinese and it, it, it totally makes no sense. So if, if they were even following the rules that, uh, that are taught, in China, they would they would not do it this way, and uh, and anyway, there are other problems, <clears throat> and of course, it's also at the same time on our side. That is, the, the old Chinese researchers, as I've pointed out, generally have not gotten very deep into paleography, uh, even the the best of them. Well, Ch uh, Carl Green did to some extent, but he was, as I say, he tended to overlook the characters that did not survive. So there's no way that this is going to be handled properly without teamwork. No, neither Laurent or I are going to, well, some, some of you perhaps, but uh, neither of us is going to be as competent ever in paleography as uh, somebody like Chen Li, or even the, the people that I'm going to be more or less criticizing. Um, so it's just not, it, it, we just have to get people uh, working together who can understand the the uh, each other's uh, fields a little bit. So, as an example, uh, there's this is let's see. There's another volume here you can see. Uh, this is a two-volume dictionary of uh, Warring States uh, script, written by uh, He Lin Yi, and uh, I use this all the time. Uh, unfortunately for him, this came out before the Guodian and Shanghai texts were discovered. So there's a huge amount of evidence that's not reflected in here. I would suspect, I don't know how old a man he is, but if, I would suspect he may be working on a new version based on what's found there. Um, I use this a lot, and for me, I think this is, uh, uh, you know, the man knows a great deal about uh, early script um, he has several books, other books on it, and articles and so forth. But in the beginning, he explains the phonetic framework that he's going to be using. And so he uses the 22 rhyme groups, uh, which he, are adapted from Wang Nian Sun. That's, these are, they are, they're divided into Yin Sheng, Ru Sheng, and Yang Sheng. Yin Sheng 
are basically open syllables or vocalic codas. Rusheng is stop codas and Yangsheng is nasal codas. So there are 22 rhyme groups. Uh, and <clears throat> if you take each rhyme group and you see what the possibilities in our reconstruction system are within that rhyme group, most of them correspond to at least two different things in our system. So the jibu correspond, uh, words in both schwa and schwa k belong to the jibu. Uh, some of them as many as four. So yo bu has got u, iu, uk, and iuk. All of those are uh, fall within the traditional yobu. So if you're just saying, well, this is yobu and this is yobu, uh, you may be ma uh, matching an, a U against an IWK or something like that. Uh, so that's one of the problems. Here's the same thing with the, uh, with the Rusheng groups, uh, even though this is not Rusheng, and I won't get into that. Uh, and here are the nasal ones. Some of the nasal ones are exactly the categories that we would identify, uh, so that's not a problem. Uh, there are little details like uh, this I plus velar nasal, we think uh, divided. This is one thing we haven't actually assigned a geographical uh, region to, but sometimes they go to e ing and sometimes they go to I-N, uh, so that's a, a kind of overlap. Okay, then, uh, so that was the 22 rhyme groups he uses. And then he uses 19 initials uh, identified by Huang Khan. Uh, his dates are there. And I've added phonetic symbols that would give you some idea of what these might stand for, although then these are never used uh, by Hulin Yi or people who use this system typically. Uh, what uh, Huang Khan did, Huang Khan actually paid a great deal of attention to distribution. I mean, in the same way that you remember uh, uh, yesterday, I was taking this middle Chinese context of TS type initials and N uh, without any funny business, uh, no retroflexion, palatalization, basically the syllables of division one and division four. Well, Huang Khan did exactly the same thing. And he decided that the, that the finals that you find in division one and four are the original finals. Okay, and the initials that you find there are the original initials. Okay, and uh, so this is from that set. These are the 19, I mean, I haven't double checked. I think this is exactly what you get in divisions one and, and uh, four of middle Chinese. Notice there's a gap here. Uh, there, a G, initial G never occurs in division one and four. We get the uh, Xiamu instead, there's some kind of a, of a spirant. Okay, so. <clears throat> How many categories does that identify? Well, it brings up 418 types. But, and most of the categories already include several different categories in our system. But the words don't have to even belong to the same type to be considered as loan characters for each other. And it's not always clear what degree of similarity one should insist on. So uh, let me give you an example. That's legible, right? Okay. Um, get rid of this mess. So, uh, oh well, I didn't write the word. This is the word that I'm interested in. And for some, I'll put it up here at the top. This is usually read ba nowadays. Uh, to be dismissed from office or to leave office. Uh, and it's uh, reconstructed this way. Oh, don't, somebody remind me if, at the end of this to talk about my and my, okay, because that's also relevant. Uh, this is not what we generally expect from R-A-J. Generally, we expect A-E rather than E-A. But we have other examples of words with labial initials in that with that, with R-A-J in type A, which also come out as E-A. In fact, that's what, why I mentioned my and my. That's probably the same thing. So this is uh, probably a sub-regularity, one of these minor uh, uh, details. Um, and uh, this character appears in three places in the Guangyun. That's the big, uh, you know, the Song Dynasty re uh, revision of the Cheyun. And I've just given you here the, uh, the uh, let's see here, 
well, never mind. Uh, I've given you here the uh, Middle Chinese. So as BJE, it says Zhen Ye, Yi Zhi Ye. So Zhen means tired. So P, it, in other ways, also can mean tired, and this word can be written, used for that word as well. And that's also got AJ, it's Ge Bu. So this is the way we would reconstruct that. It's type B. Uh, we believe there was an R there for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, and then AJ. So there's no brackets around this R, uh, we, even though usually in this situation we wouldn't know. In this case, we think we know. Uh, the same thing in Shangsheng. Oops, uh, it defined there is a Qian Yu Zui. I think this, um, I'm not sure what Qian means here. I thought it meant to, to uh, uh, send somebody off into the boondocks or something, but uh, it may mean to actually pardon. Uh, I don't know, that's, but nevertheless, it doesn't amount, matter for our arguments. That would be pronounced B. Uh, uh, now, Shangsheng usually goes to tone three. Can anybody explain to me why this is tone four in Mandarin? Uh, I'm talking about this form here. Right. Uh, Shangsheng words with with uh, voiced obstruent initials uh, systematically go to tone four to yeah to tone four in Mandarin. So that's just uh, just uh, seeing if you're on your toes. And then the most common reading is uh, this uh, B E A X, which is Qisheng for the same reason uh, Ba, uh, and this is uh, like a Ba Guan to be dismissed. Hai Rui Ba Guan, you remember was the Hai Rui dismissed from office was the piece that started the Cultural Revolution. So here's what He Lin Yi in his dictionary says about this word. Um, he says, oh, now I should mention too that you see this word down here, a couple of things first. This word xiong means uh, bear. And uh, we think that uh, one of the things that's going on here is this probably had a, uh, uh, a, 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 ra a labialized initial which is responsible for the way it, it developed. Usually, if it were just a uh, non-labialized, non it would still have an M, but it changed to uh, this WNG just like Feng Wind changed. So, and wind changed because it had an initial P, uh, and we think xiong uh, changed for the same reason. So uh, it was not, it was permitted in Old Chinese to have uh, labialized initials before uh, labial codas. So you could have something like guam, but, uh, or guam, uh, but they all dissimilated in one way or another so that uh, uh, but and, and this also happens to come out as uh, I mean there's a there are Tibetan Tibeto Burman or other words in the area I think what what some of the words for bear dom hmm? dom I'm not sure about the d but uh, a ging hmm. uh, I thought there was something like uh, wam yeah wam and uh, maybe guma also I don't know. Anyway, so there's a bear in the picture, and uh, actually the nung itself is also a, a pictograph of a bear. Okay, in fact, I'm skipping ahead to this character, not xiong, not not the ba that I started with, but, with, but this xiong. And one theory, reasonable theory, in fact, as to what the fire is doing there, is that it's phonetic. Now it's not doesn't represent huo, it represents yan, flame. And Yan Flame also has a uh, capital G W initial and an M uh, coda, even though the vowel is different. Um, so that's uh, that's what we think uh, happened about that. But so the crucial thing is that there's uh, that this word. There's also a word for bear here, which is the same as Xiong, except it's got this little box on top. Or it's also, you could say it's the same as ba, except that it has fire on the bottom. So we have these three elements. The top one means, means net, uh, the middle one means bear, and the bottom one means, uh, well, uh, fire or flame, but the bottom one is probably 
uh, a phonetic, at least in this case. What it's doing here is, a, is another story. Um, so, but let's go back to what, so keep in mind that it, that this, well, he, uh, later on, Hulini uh, points out that he thinks that, uh, yeah, here it is, um, that the ba that we're looking at should be the chu one, an early form, an early uh, graph for this word pi, which also means bear, a different kind of bear, presumably. Even this is something like uh, brai, and I don't know whether that occurs in other languages or not. But it's uh, the Chinese dictionary say that that's also a bear. Uh, so here's what he says: uh, ba, or if it's bear, it's red p. Okay. Tsung uh, neng, wang sheng. Okay. So this means in the lingo of the uh, paleography, this is uh, imitates the. Uh, the language of the Shuo Wen Jie Zi. Tsung means it has as a character component uh, Nung, which means bear. Okay? And uh, also, of course, used to mean able and things like that, but, but it's supposed to be a picture of a bear. And the Wang is the net, and that's what the little box on top is supposed to be. It's, we don't have the, I mean, it's a reduced form, so it just looks like a, a mu, a, an eye on its side, but it's actually net. So he says that Wang is phonetic in, in this word. Well, you've seen what, what these are. Uh, let me put Wang up here. Strange things are happening. Okay. So this is, let's see. Wang. I fortunately do, do have a glottal stop. Uh, well, this is supposed to be a velar nasal. I'm just uh, doing it uh, quickly. So he says that this character, which is pronounced, uh, uh, which we reconstruct as Mang, is the phonetic in this word which is uh, p or b or ba, right, and which, whose reconstructions look like that. So what is his explanation? He says uh, uh, p has the bing initial, that's the one of uh, Huang Kan's in, uh, initials, one of the 19 initials, that's a b. Wang has the ming initial, and that's uh, m, that's supplied by me, not him. Uh, they are both labials. That's the explanation. So the one character is considered uh, phonetic in the other on the basis of the fact that they both begin with a labial consonant. Okay, even though M is very rarely used as a phonetic in words for for labial stops and vice versa, and even though the finals have nothing to do with each other, the most you can say is they have the same main vowel but they have entirely different codas. So uh, as far as I know, such uh, phonetic uh, relationships are unknown, uh, but that's, that's what it is. Now, in fairness to He Li Ni, he was trying to give some explanation, and he probably, uh, this was just the best he could come up with. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, actually Laurent came up with a, what, a, a better explanation uh, well, let me just tell you the punchline here. Uh, another word for net, a uh, bird net, supposedly, is, uh, wait a second. Uh, Uh, is this. So this is bird net. This is net. This is a bird net. So um, one of the things that you can find uh, in the early script is that, uh, and I guess uh, Bill Bolts is fond of pointing this out, is the polyvalence of a, of an, uh, of a, a graphic element as a phonetic. Uh, so 
wang is usually assumed to represent this word for net, but uh, Laurent suggested that in this word, uh, the thing on top is actually the phonetic, the phonetic, and it is uh, a picture of a net, uh, a pictograph of a net, which is what that is, but a different kind of net, namely the luo net, not the wang net. Okay. Uh, it's not that it used to be written with this as phonetic, and then they dropped the nung, that's actually what the shuo one says, but it's just that a, a picture of a, of a net, a pictograph or a net, most of the time represented wang, but you could also use it to re represent uh, uh, this other word, luo. Well, we just had an example of that with the uh, xiong, remember the fire at the bottom, uh, I said, uh, probably doesn't represent fire, which has nothing to do phonetically with bear, but uh, yen, flame, which, a, a different word, which is uh, very similar in shape. At least the, the initial consonant and the final consonant are the same uh, as this word xiong for bear. Uh, so that's another case where uh, uh, the pictograph for fire, most of the time is used to represent huo, but in some cases is used to represent yen. Okay. Uh, and yet another example, uh, I think uh, was pointed out in the, uh, at the Journée, um, uh, Jia Ting De Jia, and is it, is it Shangsheng, is that what it is? Is this word, all right, I gotta find the word here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you see pig on here, stop me. It's on here somewhere. Hmm? Maybe a little. Hmm? Ah, there it is. Okay, so one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Here it is. No. No. Yeah, okay. All right, this word is red. Jia, I haven't checked, but if this is, uh, it, I'm not sure about the tone, but it's red. Jia. It means a boar or a male pig. Uh, so it's another word for pig, in other words. And, uh, um, I'm, uh, I don't have my usual options here, okay, uh, yeah, okay, at least we've got that. Okay, so, uh, jia. Uh, sure enough, just that. Now, most people who, who look at this word regard it as a hui yi. In other words, they say, well, you, to represent a home, you have a, a, a pig with a roof over it. Because in ancient times, our ancestors kept the pigs in the house, right? Or something like that. Or downstairs, uh, whatever. Uh, I think it's uh, just the fact that, that this is... Uh, it's not that this character is the phonetic, but it's that this character shi, uh, is it third tone? No, shi, what turn, tone is it? It is third tone. Oh, seven, yes. Uh, it's just that this thing could probably stand either for shi, for pig, or for jia, for pig, and to disambiguate it, uh, well, at least uh, as a phonetic element, it stands for some kind of a pig, not necessarily shi, but in this case, probably jia. So probably the, the pig in here is a phonetic, but again, we have to assume that phonetic, the phonetic element could be used with, uh, with at least two different values, the same uh, graph. So in one case, we've got the two words for net, wang and luo, 
Another case, we've got uh, two words, uh, huo, for fire, and yan, for, uh, for uh, flame. And in this case, we've got shi and jia, both words for pig, which, uh, at least as a phonetic, could be, and this character as a phonetic could be read either way. So this is probably just a phonetic compound. Okay, so I'll go back to our argument. Uh, notice, well, here's how we reconstruct net. Um, there could well have been a pre-syllable of some kind. Uh, we don't know. Uh, maybe there's evidence, independent evidence of that, I just don't know. But that's why we write it in, in square brackets. The double R means that it's, uh, it, it has the same effect as if the, the initial were R. Uh, and what we know about these, this word uh, ba, at least, and probably also P and B. Uh, what we know that Helene did not know is that those words also have R-A-J in them. Um, well, this is uh, the ba reading, for instance, and there it is, and so forth. So I think that's a much better explanation of where the character comes from. But in order to uh, have that explanation available, you have to have this, uh, you have to come on this uh, uh, theory of R medials. Now, let me stop there and there probably are something, questions or objections or something here. So anyway, in this particular example, as I say, I, I have great respect for Holini, uh, but uh, I, it is true that we think we know things that he does not. And uh, so he, was, he had two handicaps. One is that uh, he did not have a, a, a fine-grained enough theory of old Chinese to recognize the similarity between Luo and Ba. Okay. Uh, and the various hypotheses that, uh, that cont contribute to that. Uh, and he also had uh, uh, a kind of vague uh, standards, or at least standards which could be made vague if you needed the to, them to, for what could correspond to an acceptable phonetic uh, resemblance between two forms. Yeah. Uh, well, this is uh, usually um, uh, well. I guess it has several meanings. Uh, well, let's look it up. I think this is. Uh oh. to tie, to bind together, guiding rope of a net, guiding principle, rule. Okay? So it has something to do with, with uh, string and rope and stuff like that. So it would be, it would be the semantic element. Isn't yes, it? right. Um, well, I mean, it's not really clear uh, why it, it would be there, except that uh, maybe, it's, maybe it was originally something else. I don't, I don't know, but... But uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have a good explanation for that. We know the top part is a net. That we're talking about the law character. The top part is a net. And somehow the way distinguished this net from Wang. Uh, so maybe it has some kind of a string that a Wang doesn't. I don't know where, how a bird net. Maybe, well, here's where we need the archaeologists, right, to, to, or the students of early culture, uh, material culture. Or maybe you, well, I can just go ask a fisherman today, uh, and maybe there's still this distinction. But I don't know what the difference is between a law and a wang, other than what the Schwoban tells me. Uh, Thomas, did you have a question? Okay. Okay. So it's interesting here, uh, look, no, the, uh, this is a little bit of an excursus here, but I want to show you what the Schwa one says about P. Can I just yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was about the, the Chia character, which also looks interesting and what not convincing, but it's just that the, the right part of the Chia character is Chia, right? Yes. So, um, so, okay, so, in the so why didn't they use that? So they used this with the Shir character in order to... 
So it's a kind of thing, but it's not very true, it's very jia. Yeah, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But then in the house character, why don't they use jia? Yeah. Yeah, um, I really don't know. Um, so family may have something to do with pigs and living. Oh, with yeah, I mean, I was sort of making fun of that, but, yeah. uh, but uh, I shouldn't pigs. have. Uh, yeah, it could very well be that both are the, uh, are the case. Now, I don't know. Yeah, so it's a little bit different case from uh, Yen and Hua at the bottom of... Uh, 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 yeah, it, it, it's true. It's true. Um, well, another issue, of course, is how many different kinds of pigs are there anyway, right? Um, because uh, it's very possible that the terminology for pigs uh, varied from one place to another. After all, we have swine and pig and sow and boar and all these things. So uh, one can imagine, I'm just speculating, but one can imagine that uh, uh, some people might write the character which we now read as shi for pig as jia, right? And they maybe didn't use the other word at all. The other word is not very commonly used for pig, as far as I know. Usually, at least the, the usual word is ju or something like that. So uh, it may be that the character developed in an area where that where jiao would have been the default reading for for this uh, character for a pig. So you have to think and remember that it's not all sort of one homogeneous language. It's not. I mean, I haven't. It, that's not an explanation because I don't know that all of that's true, but it, it, it's a conceivable. I come to think of it on the presentation by Yao. Yes. He, was, he spoke about neutral pigs and <laughs> asexual pigs. Oh, and neuter pigs and. Uh, and yeah, neuter pigs and, and males. Well, and I. Pigs, uh, so maybe it has got something to do with the. I, I really don't know. Territory. But I believe, I, I wasn't there, but I believe he did. Uh, uh, point out this similarity with the jia, other uh, jia character. Okay, so let's look at what the Shuo Wen says about uh, this uh, thing. It says, Qian you zui ye, uh, means, again, to move, well, again, I, I'm unsure about what, how Qian is here. It seems to mean to release one who is guilty of a crime. So it's a, some kind of pardoning. At least that's what that's what, that's what seems to be implied by Duan Yu Tsai's annotations here. Tsung Wang Neng, okay, composed of net and neng, able ability talent, Wang, Zui Wang Ye, okay, Wang, the net is the net of guilt, okay, so it's a metaphor for, for being caught up in something bad, right? Uh, Actually, these characters may be an interpolation. They, uh, Duan Yu Tsai puts them in because he finds them in the Yun Hui, but it could be simply an explanation of what the Wang is doing there. Yan Yo Xian Neng Er Ru Wang. It means that one is talented but falls into a net. So this is the, describing the guilty party. Okay, uh, but he is released. Okay. And the Jolie says, "E nung zhi bi, uh, to judge talented rulers or something like that. So this is an attempt to explain the presence of net and able in the character. And I suspect that the meaning, uh, well, that, this is a side thing. I suspect this meaning of uh, to leave office or to dismiss or to, uh, is, could be related to this word, separate, but uh, that's just a... a uh, speculation. Let's see, do I, where is it? Uh, oh, I don't think I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't put the full thing here, but, uh, oh, I guess I did, in, uh, that's, I was just looking at what the Shuowen said about uh, bear up here. Yeah, okay, here's, P, which is the kind of bear, remember, is usually written with, with both uh, uh, the net at the top and the fire at the bottom, okay? 
And uh, the Shuo Wen says for this character, like a bear, Huang Bai Wen with uh, yellow or brown and white, uh, not necessarily stripes, but, but uh, uh, decorative, you know, a, a pattern. Uh, it's from Xiong and uh, Pi Sheng Sheng. All right, so, <laughs> so what he's saying is that if you had, if they had not, the Sheng Sheng means an abbreviated phonetic. So if they had not abbreviated the phonetic, we would have P, which is, which is net and, uh, and uh, nung, and uh, xiong, which is nung and fire. And since they had two nungs, they left one of them out. Okay. But I bet that this is an error for law, textual error for law, uh, that would make sense in terms of what I was, well, in terms of uh, Laurent's idea. That is, Tsung, uh, Tsung Xiong, Luo Sheng Sheng. That is, it's the bird net character here, which is visually not too different from this. And at a late enough period, if somebody's copying the Shuo one, uh, you know, in several centuries uh, after it was written, uh, this Luo Sheng Sheng would not have made any sense to them because the L was prob uh, the R was probably already gone and didn't didn't they didn't understand the original gloss. Uh, this one at least doesn't make a great deal of sense. This is also forced, I think. Um, you know, if if this means, well, never mind. You see my point, I think, right? Um, so it suggests, at least, that that we, on the basis of all of this argument, we might have a, a proposal for em emending the uh, uh, Shuowen text. Uh, not a great big uh, deal, but still. Yes? Sorry, but what about the last sentence? That's anciently described. Oh, yeah, well... Uh, uh, Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, I mean, it's not especially related to the argument because this word uh, has, uh, it's a homonym of this P, uh, except we don't know whether P had an R in it or not. And we, I think if our story is right, then, then the bear P must have had an R in it. But uh, surely, certainly this is close enough to be a phonetic. So one wonders why they didn't uh, use this perfectly good character, but that's just the kind of thing that happens. I mean, they're, they're, they're just differences in the script. When it says Gu Wen, uh, Wang Guo Wei argued, and I think this is right, that uh, um, where the Shuo Wen says Gu Wen, what they're talking about is the pre Qin script. There's uh, Liu Guo Wen, uh, it's the script of the six states other than Qin that uh, uh, who had their own, ver each, well, maybe not each, but there were other variants of the script in that use in use in that area. Uh, I don't know any particular significance to this except that, I mean, no matter whether we're right or wrong about the rest of it, this would be a perfectly good character for for the P word meaning bear. That's, all the, well, that's what I wanted to know, but I don't know what the old Chinese for P is. So what the old Chinese, oh, for P? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, P is just... Uh, it's just a homonym uh, in Middle Chinese, so uh, let's look at them. Uh, so this word P for bear is this number five, P. Uh, I should still put this in brackets because it may have been more complex, I don't know. Some kind of bear. And then P, skin. Is exactly the same, except that we can't tell. We have no reason to construct an R there. So uh, this is skin oh, or bark of a tree. Okay. So you see, there's no problem. This is unproblematic. It's what I was struck by the fact that from the point of view of modern Mandarin, it's unproblematic. So usually, when this is the case. 
Well, sometimes you just get lucky, you know. Just, uh, yeah. Okay, well, let's return to this. Uh, let's see, I, I'm actually running out of some time here. Um, well, let me take you through a couple of examples. Uh, this is the one about the about one. Remember that in the one traditional one group, because of our assumptions about that that the rounded vowel hypothesis, which basically says that the that old Chinese did not have a W before the main vowel, uh, it did not have such an element. What it had instead were uh, labialized uh, velars and uvulars. Uh, as a con it is a consequence of that that the words in the one group have to be reconstructed with two different vowels, some with schwa and some with u. Um, so uh, now we had been calling this, oh, sorry, uh, sort of, uh, actually Pan, Pan Wu Yun calls these one e, one r, one number, sub one, one sub two. Uh, but uh, my experience is that that's very misleading because people imagine that, that we still believe that there is a single one rhyme group and somehow we've got two subdivisions within it. And we're making a stronger claim than that. We're saying it was a mistake. It was wrong to put these together. These are not a single rhyme group. They are two rhyme groups, just like any other two rhyme groups. Uh, so that's why... Uh, uh, I've decided we should start calling them just schwa in and u in. We don't, we, we're not guaranteed to, to have an, a suitable character available. A side point, the, the names that are chosen for uh, traditional rhyme groups, uh, each of them is the name of a rhyme in the Che Yun or Guang Yun. Okay, so that was the set that they were picking from. So the zhi bu, zhi hu zhe ye, the zhi bu, it's called the zhi bu because all of the words in the zhi yun belong to zhi bu, okay? So that was one of the ways of identifying it. So they picked this. But there is no guarantee that the, that the set of rhymes of the, uh, of the guang yun will have enough characters to give us appropriate levels, uh, uh, sorry, appropriate labels for the real rhyme groups, okay? So that's part of the problem is that we can't, I mean, we could make up some character, but it wouldn't be the, the name of a rhyme group, and the pro it would probably just be confusing. So that's it. So now, uh, things are all out of proportion here, but uh, there is a problem here, and that is that the word mun uh, is, appears to be phonetic in two words, one and one. One meaning to hear, and one meaning to ask. The one, as you will guess, has an S suffix, uh, which somehow changes the properties of it. Uh, so to ask is to, uh, to cause to hear or something like that. Uh, but the problem is that uh, mun, they're both in the one rhyme group, so that from the traditional standpoint, there's no problem. But for us, there is a problem because uh, mun is a schwa N word, and uh, one and one are UN words. Okay, now let me show you why we believe that. Um, well, mun, it's because of the rhymes. Mun rhymes only with word, other words that we have to reconstruct with schwa in. If we just had this uh, syllable, middle Chinese syllable, could reflect either m schwa in or m uh, m schwa in or m m u n. But on the basis of the rhyming, we don't have that option. We have to reconstruct it uh, as uh, with a schwa in order to make the rhyming. Uh, come out right, right. On the other hand, these two words, one and one, rhyme only with words like chun, uh, which we equally have to reconstruct with un. We don't have any choice, okay, uh, unless we're going to just ignore the rhyme evidence. Uh, now, so then there's this principle, tung sheng bi tung bu, that is the two characters with this, from the same uh, rhyme group well, if two characters have the same initial, uh, same uh, uh, phonetic element, then they must belong to the same rhyme group. And this is a principle enunciated by Duan Yu Tsai, and it's usually true, right? I mean, this is a, this is a valid principle in, 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 for the most part. So is the rounded vowel hypothesis in trouble? Well, you must have anticipated that no, it's not. Uh, if we look just at the Shuo one, uh, look up one in the Shuo one. Here it is. This is the small seal character. And it says, Zhi Sheng Ye. 
uh, to no sounds. And then uh, over here it says Tsung R. Men Sheng means it has the element R. And, uh, the, and Men, gate, is phonetic. Okay. But then down, down below it says, it gives this other character, which uh, if you uh, wrote it out modern style would be this, an, uh, R on the left and Hun on the right. In the ancient script, it has the element dusk. This hun is dusk. Okay. So the, the ancient form with hun is perfectly consistent with the rounded vowel hypothesis and also reflects the fact that this, uh, 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 I mean, the initial consonants work in Old Chinese also. Hun, uh, for other independent reasons, has to be reconstructed with m because it's phonetic in other words which have an uh, uh, initial M. Uh, m changed to a H at some point, an H or a H or something like that. Um, so, um, so here's what happened. The old character, we're using Hun as a phonetic. It's not only that, first of all, two sound changes occurred. First of all, the, uh, f the rounded and unrounded vowels merged after labial initials. Remember, in Middle Chinese, there's no contrast of chako and kaiko. It's, it's all, uh, uh, there's never such a contrast. So, um, so after that merger had taken place, which, may, which we think actually was pretty early, uh, maybe still in the late Zhanggo period, uh, these two, uh, then, then after that, mun would be a perfectly good phonetic for one. On the other hand, there would have been a problem with hun, perhaps, because after m has changed to h, then you've got hun used as phonetic to write one, and uh, you can't see the connection anymore. That is, uh, it no longer, they no longer both begin with a labial. And so they had bo reasons both to adopt mun and to discard hun as phonetic in these characters. Okay, so. This is uh, from a list of characters in the, in the Guodian uh, text. Uh, this is by uh, uh, Zhang Shoujun et, et al. Uh, this is a list of all the forms of to hear that occur in the, uh, in the Guodian text. There are a bunch of different forms, actually. This is the one, like the one in the Shuo, and except that the ear is on the right. Uh, this is similar. Uh, this one, I don't know what it is. It's something above an ear. Uh, same thing here, same thing here, and then this looks like some kind of a pictograph of a person. I don't know exactly what's going on, but uh, what you don't have is uh, you have no forms with a phonetic mun. And uh, so now we switch into French because I gave this <laughs> presentation in French uh, two years ago here, in fact. So, uh, so if you're going by the traditional analysis, uh, there's really no problem with uh, mun and wen. That is, it's nothing strange about it at all. They're both in the one group. They're perfectly okay. So there's nothing that would tip you off that there's anything anomalous about these characters. But according to our system, gives us a, a warning or reminds us that that this that the one and one characters are not consistent with the phonological system that we've reconstructed for Old Chinese. And so they must, we predict from this that the, uh, that the phonetic compounds which mix schwa in and un should be late characters. Okay? And that's a prediction which you can test. Uh, if, so that's, and in fact, if you do look at the excavated text, and there are some, I think, where you begin to have this, uh, uh, the one and so forth. So at least a Chinese student told me this, but Overwhelmingly, you have the other characters, and the farther back you go, I think the less likely you are to have the one uh, for sure. So, uh, yeah. So I claim, as they say at Microsoft, this is, uh, and I'm, I forgive, forgive me, those of you who've heard this joke for several times, that this is uh, not a bug; it's a feature. It looked like a problem for our analysis that uh, of these phonetic compounds, but it actually. Uh, calls attention to a case where we can, uh, we can say more than the traditional analysis can. We, we can make predictions which are, in fact, uh, confirmed. Okay, let me run through another cu a couple of examples quickly. These have to do with uh, uh, 
reconstruction of textual history, you'll remember that uh, uh, Yue was one of the traditional groups that we had to read, had to, were, were compelled to reconstruct with three different vowels. So we have to, unless something funny was going on with a rhyming, we have to, we would predict that, that the Yue group is not one group, but three groups, which have been uh, combined in error. Um, and these are, these are the three words, ke is A-T, mie is E-T, and Yue is O-T, as you'll see in a moment. This is the Middle Chinese. Cargren's reconstruction is like this, all have some kind of an a. Ah. Li Fanggui has at, at, at. Guo Xiliang, at, at, at. Guo Xiliang is a handbook of old Chinese pronunciation where you can look up anything. But for us, we have to, I'm not sure these are up to date, but they, we have to reconstruct them at, et, and ot. Okay, so here's a, a passage in Lao Tzu, chapter 39. Uh, where we have a, a six-line uh, rhyming sequence. Lie, fa, xie, jie, mie, jue. Okay. Uh, I don't know what that thing is there, there but uh, uh, if, you, if you reconstruct them, then it's at, 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 et, at. Okay. So they all fit perfectly as at words, at words, except for mie, which absolutely has to be reconstructed with a front vowel. So, okay, two things happened here. First of all, um, uh, well, Bill Bowles wrote an article based not on excavated texts, but just upon uh, Wang Bi's commentary. He, it's a nice uh, paper called something like the Wang Bi version that Wang Bi never saw or something like this. If you look at the modern uh, Wang Bi version of Lao Tzu, this line which has the, the uh, suspicious rhyme is in there. But if you look, what the point he made was that if you look at the uh, Wang Bi's annotations, he normally has something to say about each line, but that one is omitted. Okay, and so it, he drew the conclusion that the version of, the, of Lao Tzu that uh, Wang Bi had in front of him, that he based his commentary on, lacked this line. Okay. Uh, even though it has been restored in later versions of what's supposed to be his version of the Lao Tzu. Okay. Uh, but it's also the case that in the uh, silk manuscripts for, uh, uh, versions of, uh, Ma Wang, of uh, Lao Tzu and Ma Wang Dui, uh, I believe they both have this passage and it's missing, this line is myth missing in both cases. So again, this points out that this, this is a, a clue from our phonological reconstruction that there's something fishy about this line it looks like it ought to be a late insertion because it would have been inserted after either rhyming patterns became less uh, rigid, which may have happened, uh, but or uh, after some of these vowels got fronted and and, uh, and it was a perfectly considered a perfectly good rhyme. But it does not rhyme according to old Chinese phonology. Okay, so uh, this is another uh, plus for us. Uh, so if you look at this with, from the standpoint of either traditional analysis with the rhyme category names or pre, uh, previous reconstructions, or at least you know, earlier reconstructions like uh, Carl Grin, Li Fang Gui, uh, and so forth, there's absolutely nothing peculiar about that line. It, it's just fine. You, you would never uh, notice anything funny about it. But uh, our reconstruction tells us that there's something funny about it. And this is a, a prediction which can be uh, tested the next time somebody digs up a version of the uh, Lao Tzu. Okay, questions to this point or comments? Okay, let me forge ahead then. A similar thing with the Yuan group. Uh, uh, it's considered a single group, but for us it's three groups. We have to reconstruct an, in, and on, just like we had at, et, and ot. And uh, there's a passage in the Shi Jing. I'm using Cargren's uh, uh, translation here, uh, and we have Luan Yuan, uh, uh, or I guess it's Lian now. Uh, Wan Shan Guan Fan Luan. Okay. Well, if you look at it from the standpoint of our reconstruction, again, some the initials may be uh, obsolete now. I'm not sure this was pre uvular, but uh, we have on 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 on. 
It's possible that you have a change in rhyme, in rhyme here because these two are, well, well, never mind about that. I, anyway, uh, I, that's just a, uh, the point is they're all on instead of, except for this one line which has fun and, uh, and that has on. Okay, well, the, here the Jing Dian Shu one comes in handy because uh, uh, this is the comment from the Jing Dian Shu one about this passage, about Fan Xi, that's the, that's the passage, and it says Ru Zi, which means Fan has its usual pronunciation. <coughs> Fu Ye, meaning to return or something. Han Shi Zuo Bian, Bian Yi, okay, so Bian meaning to change. Okay, so the Han Shi is a lost version of the Shu Jing. We only have uh, fragments of it quoted in other texts. One of those texts is the Jing Dian Shi Wan. Uh, Lu Daming still had access to the Han Shi, um, and he says the Han Shi has been where the where the Mao Shi has fun. Okay, uh, now why did I get that? Oh yeah, well this is supposed. Yeah, I should have, uh, this is supposed to be changed to bien here. I can't do it. Anyway, pretend that this says bien over here. That is the, the, and the point is that bien uh, has to be re reconstructed with on because of the phonetic element used to write it and because of its rhymes. So uh, between, if we had to choose between fan and bien, bien is consistent with our reconstruction and fan is not. Okay. Uh, Carlgren also commented on this. These are the two versions. Uh, Si shi fan xi, the four arrows uh, return, or si shi bian xi. And uh, Carlgren says, uh, looks at both of them, he says that either one of them might make sense in the passage, and so he says it is undecidable which version best represents the original shi. But only the Han version is consistent with our reconstruction. Now, uh, some people may already be worried about Lectio Difficilior, and um, we can talk about that uh, uh, later, but uh, if you want. Uh, also, more recently, not only the Han Shi, but excerpts from the Shi Jing are found in this uh, Shanghai ba Museum text, a bamboo text from uh, around uh, 300 uh, BC or so. Kung Zi Shi Lun, Confucius discusses the Shi Jing. And uh, here's the line, uh, say, si shi bian, okay? Well, I wouldn't have known this, but uh, 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 Li Jia Hao, a very fine uh, uh, paleographer, has established to uh, pretty much satisfactorily that this graph, which we find here, uh, it represents bian, to change, okay? And so, we have it confirmed not just from the Han Shi, quoted, as quoted in the Jingdian Shi Wen, but also uh, the others. Now, let me see, I, I, let me just, I'll just take one more example. Uh, I talked about Mei, uh, Mei Li de Mei yesterday, and how, yeah, well, we reconstructed it with Shua J. Ed did, as did Wang Li originally, Axel Schussler does that, Sergei uh, Starostin did that, here are the people who reconstructed as IJ, put it in the other rhyme group. Dong Tong Ha, Zhou Zhu Mo, Li Fan Gui, Zhou Fa Gao, Wang Li, Tang Zuo Fan, Xiang Xi, Guo Xi Liang, Han Yu Da Zi Dian, Li Zhen Hua, and Wang Li's uh, uh, dictionary. All of those say, will tell you that the word belongs in Zhi Bu, which implies that it had a front vowel. But uh, here you see it written with in fact, the way it's written is, in, is just the right-hand side of, of way itself. Uh, so it has, the word itself has an intimate connection to the name of the Wei Bu, the, uh, the Shua J rhyme group. Okay, so you, you get the idea. Uh, as, uh, well, I think I'll stop there. Isn't it about time or not? It's told. All right, well, let me... Uh, uh, let me run through this a little bit, see if there's anything I want to add. No. Okay, I have another document, though, that I would like to show you. Uh, oh, my. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
Well, uh, again, this is, uh, Laurent part, uh, pointed this out, but, uh, uh, well, my is actually not, uh, I don't think it's in the, uh, in, in GSR, and you can imagine that the word for buy and sell might be somewhat late. Uh, but I think it's still uh, uh, early enough for us to be thinking about. Now, uh, this EA usually represents um, this in Old Chinese. Okay, this is the so-called jiabu, or uh, the other names for it as well, or jibu. Uh, so sometimes, um, I guess originally, I, if I had nothing else to go on, I would reconstruct it as uh, this with a glottal stop. Uh, that's the glottal stop. Or I'll put it uh, like that, okay? But uh, we just saw in the case of ba, uh, well, first of all, quite apart from that, ea and ae are frequently confused in Middle Chinese. Uh, these two are adjacent rhymes with uh, the same initial consonant, which is the, in the uh, che yun and guang yun, which is a situation which I suggested to you, suggested, uh, means that at least some people uh, probably pr did not make a distinction between these two. For some people, it was just one big uh, rhyme. Uh, there were only some people who separated them. But even if there's a, even if the separation, even if this is just an, is not an error for AE, uh, we saw this case with BA. Uh, Uh, let's see, what did I do? This is just one of the readings, of course. Uh, uh, this also has the same pattern. That is, we have, uh, everybody agrees that this is a gobu, that it ends, for, in our terms, it ends in aj. But here, too, we have this uh, ea, where we would have ex otherwise expected uh, ae. It, it could be that this is simply... Uh, a, uh, a sub-regularity that labial initial words with uh, second division words in gobu went to this rhyme instead of the other one. Although that can't be the whole story because horse is in the one it's supposed to be in. Um, but in any case, uh, it suggests the possibility that the top part of my might well be uh, the same uh, net with the same value as it is in ba. Okay. Actually, Laurent came up with this first before we found ba, but uh, so, he, uh, so we think that it is in fact uh, this, and the wang at the top So we have to have an R in to buy anyway. And uh, although your first reaction would be to reconstruct an, an E vowel here, an AJ is also possible, and that would explain the structure of the character, which is otherwise sort of strange. Uh, and uh, it may, uh, may mean that there was some kind of labial thing, a uh, pre-syllable on this net word, because we have it now in two different labial initial words uh, in uh, if we're right, in my and also in ba or pi, the word for bear. That's what I was going to say about that. Uh, so, um, let me see if I can find this document I was working on. Yeah, I made up some notes here. 
Uh, let me make this smaller. Uh, oh, it's already, sorry. Try oh. 14. Just 12, what the heck. Even that's not enough. Um, oh, maybe if I try norm, no, that's normal page layout. Where? Oh, 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 oh. I didn't even know that. So let's try. Oh, maybe we can do a little bit bigger than that. Okay, that'll do. Okay. So uh, these are just some notes I've been re making recently and, and, uh, and some phonological interpretations about them. So do you know about this chant site? If you're doing it, you should try to get access to it if you don't. It's uh, chant.org. Uh, this is a Hong Kong uh, site, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, I believe, where uh, uh, they have put up a huge uh, body of uh, Chinese literature. Uh, all the classical texts are there, the, the histories are there, uh, and they also have a section with uh, oracle bones, bronze inscriptions, and uh, the bamboo strip inscriptions and silk uh, in inscriptions that are excavated. And uh, they, I believe they actually have sca uh, scans of, you know, images of all of the stuff so that you can look directly at that. But as a kind of quick and dirty w may way of going through this stuff quickly, uh, th they have a transcribed version and they'll put in parentheses the words that they think are represented by the character to the left if it's not, if it doesn't have its usual value. So um, this is actually from Ma Wang Dui, uh, uh, Lao Tzu, the uh, Lao Tzu uh, silk manuscript, I don't know which one this is, oh it's Jiao Ben, so it's the, it's the first uh, silk manuscript of Lao Tzu from, uh, at the, after the end of the Lao Tzu, another text begins, which has been given the name Wu Xing, and I don't, I think this was, a text was not previously known, and uh, to my delight it has a lot of quotations from the Shi Jing, which are interesting because of the rhymes and so forth. So here's one, uh, Shu Jiu Zai Sang Qi Zi Qi Xi, Shu Ren Jun Zi Qi Yi Yi Xi. Okay, what's interesting here is that in this text, uh, the, the Mao Shu has this, which everybody, there's no problem, this is what it is. It's a final particle, it's H E J, and it comes from a velar or maybe a laryngeal. Um, I think that's right. But here it's written with this word Shi, meaning clan. Well, shi is uh, middle Chinese, D-Z-Y-E-X, that's a palatal. So if, and, and in fact, we think partly on the basis of this, but already we thought that this was, a, uh, had a velar initial because, uh, which, and the, the palatal initial in middle Chinese is explained by the fact that in type B, if you have a velar initial before a front vowel, then the initial will palatalize, okay? And so that's, that's the regular rule. So this would be the normal reflex uh, of this, okay? But it's a little bit complicated because, uh, you know, here's another example of this palatalization uh, that's well known, this zhi uh, branch. Uh, uh, it's used in, well, reason we think this was palatal, it was velar, uh, among other things is that it's used as a phonetic still in some words which have velar initials. Uh, the same is true with this zhi, you have zha ji de ji, this skill or whatever, and that has a velar initial, but it has this as phonetic. So we reconstruct it as ke, no brackets, no parentheses, nothing. Uh, Southern Min has ki here. And uh, I'm told by Sven that this uh, stand is used, is this in Manyogana? for key, 
Um, all right, so then the question is, when did this palatalization, one question is, when did this palatalization take place? Well, in fact, one of the things that's been a little tricky about this uh, shi, the clan word, is that in Middle Chinese, it's a homonym of shi bu shi de shi, this one. Okay. And, uh, and we, in excavated texts, we do find, in late Zhanghua excavated texts, we do find this character used to write this one. Now, as far as I know, we have no reason to believe that this one ever had a, a velar initial. So, one possibility that this suggests is where you find this, uh, the shibu shida shi, written with this character, you're looking at a dialect, a representation of a dialect where this palatalization has already occurred. Okay. Uh, one of the places you find it, and very early, is a uh, homa meng shu, which date from the 5th or 6th century. Uh, uh, you also find it in Shanghai Museum, some Shanghai Museum documents, not all, but they're, uh, uh, they're some, uh, a couple of centuries later. Uh, the Homa Mengshu, in terms of geography, these are from, uh, uh, that's from Shanxi, which is the ancient state of Jin. And uh, one of the things I found in, I mean, I was trying to find out exactly where, uh, this sub, this habit of writing shi, shi de shi with this uh, occurred. And I looked at my trusty uh, He Li Ni. This is the kind of thing he's great for. And I mean, just I uh, didn't mention this, but He identifies five different script systems uh, in different parts of China. There's the Yan Xi, Qi Xi, Jin Xi, Chu Xi, and Qin Xi. Okay. So uh, Homa Mengshu is uh, would be the Jin Shi. Jin is just the literary name for Shanxi. Uh, we also the Shanghai documents are probably Chu Shi, presumably because they're found in the Chu area. So we we have evidence of this palatalization, if that's what it really is, in these two central areas in uh, uh, Shanxi in the Jin area and in the Chu area to the south of that. Um, but if you go to the Far East, we have dialects uh, such as the, whatever was the ancestor of the Min dialects, where this palatalization did not occur, evidently, because the, the velars are still there in, in Min. And uh, there's another little story about the, uh, it's kind of complicated, but it has to do with this, uh, uh, let's see here. Mm, qi shan, this qi. Uh, qi shan is the, I guess it's supposed to be the homeland of the, the Zhou in some sense. Anyway, it's in Shanxi, or to the west of Shanxi, right? Uh, and this has got the a velar phonetic, but, uh, uh, or velar or laryngeal, we're not sure, but uh, this is Middle Chinese. Uh, well, there's disagreement. Sometimes you find it as that. Sometimes you find it as that. Okay. Uh, so the difference is that this is a uh, this is a third division Chungnyo, which is what you would get if you had uh, 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 an R there. So yeah, let me say Qi. This uh, qi, there are t these two readings, um, yeah, well, y you find both readings and uh, Yan Zhitui, who is one of the authors of the Che Yun, uh, in Yan Shi Jia Xun, he says that, uh, I believe he says that, uh, you know, ignorant people pronounce it this way, but you, my children, should learn to pronounce it this way. Uh, one of the reasons why we believe that the distinction had some reality, because he warns this, his family against one. But this, this syllable shouldn't exist, because if you have a velar before a, a an E in type B, it should palatalize. 
But remember, it's a place name, and place names often uh, seem to preserve the local pronunciation, uh, even if that wouldn't be regular for the, rest of the language of the rest of the place. So I suspect that this was pronounced, that there was no palatalization in that area also. So we have palatalization as an innovation uh, starting in the middle, which n didn't ever necessarily make it to the two ends. Um, and that's suggested by this. But it's a, it's a paleographic problem to establish exactly who it is that writes this, that uses this graph for sure. And uh, it, I mean, in, in the Shanghai Museum documents, we have both. So maybe, can, does that mean you can sort the documents into two kinds of script? Uh, do those, do, do the uh, ones who use uh, this clan for Shibu uh, do they, do those uh, documents have other things in common that would, that would link them? So do we have maybe two different scribal traditions? You know, all of those are uh, sort of open questions now. Um, all right, well that's, I think I should stop now for, for discussion. Or break. It's just time for the break. Yeah, right. Break. Um, the floor is open um, for a discussion of anything, really. This is our last day, and so um, uh, we can talk about anything that uh, is on your mind about this uh, business, not just uh, the well, I talked about this morning. Yes. Well, I just one small question and one maybe bigger problem. It's interesting for everybody. I I would like to look at the character Mai for the small problem, just to compare how exactly you reconstruct Mai. Mai. So, oh. And um, the bigger problem, you it's just also a question for you. You are not going to talk about Chinese script with syllables. Just oh, I can say a little bit about that. that. Yes, I'm, I intended to. Let me see. Yeah. Um, yeah, that I skipped over sort of in my, uh, uh, yeah, okay, hang on just a moment, let's see, oh. Well, I'll, uh, uh, we have a lot of stuff here. Yeah, this is where it started. Yeah, I pretty much had to, uh, at least I don't remember how much I went over, but it, it must have been very quick. So the point about the, the script is this, that people uh, who have learned the modern script, we suspect are likely to think anachronistically about the pre-Chin script. Um, the pre-Chin script was phonetically much less arbitrary than the modern script. And the modern script, uh, as you know, has changed very little in the last 2,000 years or so, while pronunciation has obviously changed a lot. Uh, in the pre-Chin script, uh, a lot of things are variable. For example, it's commonplace among the uh, paleographers to note that these four, phonetic, these four radicals are used pretty much interchangeably. So is yen and yin, and these two birds pretty much uh, however you like. Also, sometimes words are written with the radical, sometimes without, uh, and so forth. So now, if you're learning Chinese, you have to learn several thousand graphs, uh, which stand roughly for morphemes. Um, and the phonetic elements are still there, and they do provide useful hints, but they're certainly not the basis of it. Basically, what you have to do is you have to learn several thousand graphs. I mean, the more thousands, the more... It, literate you are, but uh, at least, uh, you know, just to read a newspaper you need 3,000 3, or 4,000 probably. In the pre-Chin period, you had about a thousand phonetic graphs, 
what we're suggesting is that that's what you learned, is you learned a thousand uh, graphs, which each of which stood for uh, a set of, a, a type of syllable, or, a, or each of which, you know, represented a syllable of a certain kind. Um, that was the basis of the writing system. Uh, and then you uh, had, there were some characters which are simply outside the system, they're pictograms or, or hui yi or something which uh, don't, uh, uh, which you have to learn also, uh, although they're often, those characters are often used as phonetics themselves, so that there's that. Uh, there are also some characters, I don't know, how, I haven't tried to figure out how many, there are some characters which are used as pictographs which are virtually never used as phonetics. Uh, and I wonder about those, I don't know what's going on there, but in, in some sense if, if what we're saying ha is right about the script, these are outside the phonetic, uh, the main phonetic portion of the script. Uh, so, and you have these semantic elements which you can use to reduce the ambiguity of what you write, and these can be more habitual or less habitual, but from the texts, from the preaching texts that we can actually see, uh, we see that there's a great deal of variability from one scribe to another, even on the same uh, strip, sometimes you'll find the same character written several different ways. So, um, again, this is uh, Laurent's idea, basically, is that in some ways, it represents a syllab a, a kind. It's similar to a syllabary. Uh, now we, uh, uh, the, this brings the house down if you uh, say this in public. So we started saying it's a quasi syllabary. The thing about a syllabary is you have a a symbol for each syllable. Um, we're not claiming that the Chin script worked like that, and most of the time, you have. Uh, for any syllab syllable in a syllabary, you have only one way to write it, although it's not necessarily that way. You can have more than one way. If you think about sort of looser versions of what a syllabary would be, you could have a set of symbols, each of which could represent not a single syllable, but a set of syllables. And since the, the, the writing probably basically represents roots and omits, largely omits the morphology, and it's in the uh, preaching period, um, uh, there's necessarily going to be phonetic variation in the uh, initial and tone and whether there's an R or not and so forth like that. So you're not going to have a representation of each syllable in the language, but you do have the sort of default situation would be that you would have uh, a symbol that represents the position of articulation uh, and the rhyme. Uh, and then whether it's got an S or a glottal stop or whether there's an R and what the manner of articulation is, uh, what prefixes it had, that would be, uh, that would all be written uh, typically with the same, with the same element. Uh, the range of, uh, of syllables that, if you have two different uh, uh, phonetic elements, their range might overlap. So, uh, so that means you have, there are certain subsets of syllables that you can write in several different ways, and we find that also. Okay. And it may be that there are some syllables that aren't covered at all. Uh, or, and uh, also, the coverage of the syllable types is not going to be completely uniform and even, because it's partly shaped by which syllables uh, you're able to write with existing pictograms. So, uh, I mean, you have, you, you inherit a set of, uh, of uh, pictograms and hui yi, uh, uh, semantic compounds and things like that. Uh, and uh, you may, if you are trying to write a particular kind of syllable, you may be kind of out of luck because there might not be an obvious uh, phonetic element to choose for that particular syllable. So this, is, this means that in some cases you will have to apply a uh, faute de mieux principle. So you have to do the best you can, uh, and so the the degree of similarity that you would find among uh, characters written with the same phonetic is not a uniform thing, but it probably varies from phonetic to phonetic. And I gave you an example this morning of uh, the assertion, at least, that uh, yen, flame, was phonetic in uh, xiong, bear. Um, 
in, uh, flame and bear would have the same initial consonant and the same coda, but the vowels have to be different. Okay? Ordinarily, you don't have more than one vowel in a phonetic series. But when you have a labial, uh, when you have a labialized initial and a labial coda, this is a rare situation, and there may not be any obvious phonetic element to choose. And so you may just have to do the best you can with the set of elements that you have. So in, for some syllable types which are unusual or, or which don't have, which are not uh, uh, as common, you may have to loosen the usual criteria for what constitutes a good uh, phonetic compound to, to, or a phonetic element to write that. So, um, so that's the basic idea. Um, you will find there's a large literature written about uh, trying to find out what the, uh, the Xiexheng principle is. That is, what was the criterion that allowed you to write, uh, you know, that, that determined what set of sounds could be written with the same phonetic. Now, one of the consequences of the view that we're uh, suggesting is that there is no uniform Xiexheng uh, principle. Uh, the strictness or the laxness of the use of, uh, of uh, phonetic elements will uh, vary depending on how uh, densely packed the phonological space is in that particular area. So, in, although typically a phonetic will be used for uh, 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 syllables with a certain position of articulation in the initial uh, and the s same rhyme, that is ma uh, main vowel and coda, uh, the other things can usually vary. Whether it's type, e or, uh, type A or type B, whether it's got an R or not an R, whether it's uh, got a glottal stop or not got a glottal stop at the end. But, uh, in some cases, you're so, you would be so blessed with uh, uh, phonetic elements that you could have phonetics which were more specific than that. So uh, Laurent pointed out in his book that there are phonetics which only write type A syllables. Right? So, that, so in some parts of the phonological space, you may have the luxury of using phonetics which are much more specific than in other parts of the, of the phonetic, uh, uh, phonological space. Okay, do you see what we're talking about? But basically, uh, it's not as hard as learning to write modern Chinese, okay? You, it's, you have to learn a significantly fewer, a smaller number of elements. And uh, the phonetic principle of the script is much stronger than it is now. Okay, you don't, uh, and, and you have the, uh, no, no one, w you will not fail an examination if you write a character with a different phonetic or, or, or leave out the, the radical or something like that, okay? So there's much greater latitude. Um, so basically, a, the, the main part, the bulk of the script consists of a set of uh, elements used phonetically uh, and learning which, what range of phonetics each of those, uh, of, of syllable types each of those covers. Okay, and it's not necessarily a uniform uh, thing from one place to another, because we do find more uh, sort of freer phonological connections in rarer syllable types, such as the ones that end in labials. That yeah. was also my question. What, what, what period of time was it used and when was it used as a syllabary? Because what well, uh, quasi-syllabary. Mm -hmm. Quasi-syllabary. Because it presupposes that it was a stage of language which was uniform for the script and which would allow to map syllables, to have certain syllable types and to stick to a certain kind of schedule. But what we also see and what we know about old Chinese is that it was used over a very broad area mm -hmm. and covering different dialects and covering maybe even non-Chinese languages, mm -hmm. whatever like barbarian languages they were. So it was... Yeah, I'm not claiming there was a single system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite the contrary. Yeah. Um, I'm saying that in, an individual in one individual in one at one place in time will learn one set of phonetic uh, elements. It may be that he just learns the ones that his teacher teaches him. 
So there may be scribal traditions involved. It's very interesting the, the variety of script you find in the Shanghai Museum documents, for example. Uh, Dao, uh, Dao, the Dao is written with uh, uh, Xing and a Ren in the middle, for instance. Never, nobody saw this character before, as far as I know. Uh, so, no, uh, again, one of our principles is to not shrink from the diversity of the system. Uh, different scribes, it may be that there are no two scribes who write exactly the same way, but each one is writing with that kind of a set in mind, okay? Uh, that's the first point, okay? So, if that's the case, then I think it's reasonable to assume that there will be a tendency to settle on one phonetic element for each type of syllables. That is, if you have a, bu a couple of different ways to write the same kind of syllable, uh, you'll probably favor one and, and the other one will lose out. Now, people might do this differently and they still keep, uh, keep going, but at least as a heuristic, this suggests that when we see characters which appear to us to be homonyms, both widely used as phonetics, uh, yeah, uh, Laurent mentioned this before, um, then uh, there's probably, it's probably worth looking for some distinction between them, uh, especially if they're not used interchangeably. So uh, Laurent used the example of the uh, yang, the two yangs, the, the sheep and the, the yin yang, the yang, okay, which, both of which in the past, we reconstructed as L, A, uh, velar nasal, um, and uh, uh, both of them are, are phonetic in a large set of syllables, but there's not all that much, I mean, we haven't done the counts exactly, but there's not all that much overlap in the words that are represented by these two phonetics. So we suspect that there was some difference between them. Now that's not why we invented or why we added uh, uvulars to the system, but uvulars uh, allow a certain solution to this. And so it's part of our uvular theory that uh, this capital G in type B syllables, the voiced uvular stop, uh, which, well, basically it's almost as if it disappeared, but it, it uh, capital G goes to Y in Middle Chinese. So it has the same reflex as L does in type B. And so that, that creates that kind of situation. And we have a number of pairs of uh, phonetics like that. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, we have uh, E and uh, E. Okay. The, in Middle Chinese, these are both YIX. But uh, actually, uh, Carlgren, part of the Carlgren system that everybody threw out, including us, um, it probably, he, he may have been on the right track in some cases. I don't remember how he reconstructs this second one, but I think he did have a G that, that went to, uh, to Middle Chinese Y, as well as a D and a Z and so forth. So we think uh, from the connections that this one is L, Schwa, and then I'll put that for glottal stop. And this one was capital G, schwa, glottal stop, okay? Um, and uh, so these two are, I mean, occasionally they're confused, but they are, uh, uh, well, it, there's it, well, I guess mostly they're confused by the, uh, by the modern uh, uh, scholars, because uh, I know there's one case in the published Shanghai manuscripts where uh, they read a character as this first E, but if you look at the, at the bamboo uh, strip itself, the, the photograph, it's very clearly the other one. So, the, I mean, it's, they do get confused, but... Um, in oh, yeah, yeah, by that time, you're already in Middle Chinese, so it's no, yeah. there's no surprise. But then again, you have, you have to explain not only the things you find, but also the things that you don't find. So if you don't find them used interchangeably in, in the pre-Chin period, and you do find them used interchangeably in Tang, something is different. I mean, it's not necessarily this, but 
But uh, the lack of uh, contact between these two series, relative lack uh, at least, uh, is suggestive that, that you, we need to find some difference between them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the, the, uh, the, the possibility or the fact that uh, there might be different traditions of writing from different scribes and areas. Now, did the Chinese make concordances of those things? I mean, is this a did they make what? Concordances? Concordances? Or, or, or just lists, you know, traditional... Uh, Mostly it's just lists, so that you have... You know, uh, placing them so that you could have an idea that, oh, these are really in complementary distribution, they're not, they belong to different traditions. Well, is let me that think. Is part of their approach or not? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, kind of the, uh, there's been a tendency in the, in the, in the traditional phonology or philo philology in China to assume that, that the system is uniform. Uh, now, not everybody assumes that. Some people are, are clear about the fact that at least uh, in their own time, there are all, all sorts of different kinds of Chinese. But uh, in many cases, they regarded this as a kind of decadence from the period, the pre Qin period, before things, uh, before people got lax and stupid and lazy and things like that. Uh, and so you, you find uh, uh, even people who recognize that, the, that language is diverse in their own time or has been diverse for several centuries don't necessarily think that it was diverse in, uh, in the pre-Chin period. Uh, and you find them using, for instance, justifying the rhyme categories with rhymes over a thousand year period. Uh, so that's a part of philology that could also be modernized? Of course, yes, right. Now, um, part of philology is to list all the different variants, and some of them are regarded as gu wen, that is, it's following the Shuo one. There, there is a standard way. Uh, there's still some variation within it, but but the the one, the Qin emperor uh, standardized the script, and uh, so you weren't supposed to write the old way. You're supposed to write this new, more or less uniform way, and uh, uh, and that pretty much uh, is what happened at some level. Uh, there, I mean, we also find in the Dunhuang documents we find a lot of characters that are not in the in the dictionaries, right? I mean, so there's a popular tradition which is constantly undermining this uh, attempt to, uh, to standardize the script. But in terms of explicitly studying this, mostly what I think it's treated as things saying, they will, somebody will say, uh, we have, if you're trying to write, if you see this, if an ancient text has this word, it might be written this way, this way, this way, this way, or this way. So there'll be lists for each word. But they won't necessarily say uh, that they won't necessarily connect the list for this word with the, with the list for another word and say, okay, this is the so and so tradition. Now, as I say, one, I, I didn't quite finish this point, but one of the, the great things about Holyanese dictionary is he distinguishes five different pre Qin writing s systems uh, geographically. And uh, the one where this palatalization may have taken place is the Jin, uh, jin Xi and Chu Xi. Okay, I don't know if he mentions Chu Xi, but it's clearly there in the in the Shanghai script, in Shanghai texts. So, um, but that's the first time I've ever really seen any attempt to do that. Uh, so it's not part of the it's not part of the Chinese tradition to study local script uh, systems as as a variant of you know as a system. Uh, now there is, I mean, we do have things like there's the Fang Yan, is this uh, uh, rather old, uh, you know, Western Han document, which talks a lot about uh, about uh, the vocabulary of different places, and he uses geographical terms, and he uses things like the the uh, what uh, I think it's Tungs uh, or something like that. It's the this the uh, standard word or the, the word that e that's used everywhere as opposed to these local words that are used here, there, and, the, and yonder. But that applies to spoken forms and not to 
script. And even then, it's not systematized. It's not organized by place. It's organized by word. And under each word, then you list how it's, uh, what is said in, in a whole bunch of different places. And mo many of them, probably the majority of them, are either Chinese words which did not survive or, or simply weren't Chinese words at all or some other language. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I, I think uh, you'll see. Let's look at these, for example. Uh, the traditional system will say, you know, there's a whole bunch of words which have this uh, character number one as their uh, phonetic, and a whole bunch of words which have character number two as their phonetic. And these are, th and their people will group the, them together by phonetic. Uh, and so forth. What's new about our approach is that uh, we are paying attention to the fact that you have apparently synonymous uh, or homonymous uh, uh, phonetic elements which do not overlap much. Okay, that's what's new. So, uh, in the traditional way, there's no. Uh, it, it's not considered surprising that you would have two or three different phonetics available for a particular type of syllable. And so they don't notice the cases where you have two or, different thing, two or three different things which look the same, but which are used very differently. Well, but they didn't notice it because they didn't have the reconstruction systems that you have. Well, so uh, I know, they could still have, uh, yeah. yeah, they could still have noticed on the semantic basis. That is, if you go through all of the words that people say are written with the with the first gung phonetic and the words written with the second gung phonetic, mm -hmm. uh, there are not many words that can be written either way. Mm -hmm. uh, usually it's either one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so that, they, you wouldn't need a reconstruction to do that. Uh, you might need a reconstruction to explain it, or you might need to be working on a reconstruction to worry about it, but... Uh, Mm -hmm. which would use different things. So the idea is basically, most probably, implicit that there should be some kind of distinction with different things, even now, homophonous now, mm -hmm. used to mark different groups of words. Well, um, mm -hmm. well, first of all, there certainly are cases where the same word can be written with more than one phonetic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as time went on and as some of these distinctions got lost, uh, we would expect that the, that, that would happen. Um, um, and I think that probably if you ask someone why this word is written with the first gung and this word is, and all of these words are written with the second gung, they would simply say that's, what, that's the way they're written. I mean, this is a tradition. There is a tradition of writing these words with the first one and of writing these words with the second one. And uh, it would simply be incorrect, <laughs> you know, to write, mm -hmm. to cross that. So the, it, it, there would be defined not by phonology, but just by uh, a sort of arbitrary tradition of the, of the script. Uh, you know, the, the Shuo one says it's written this way, and so that's the way it's written, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So let me look. Uh, these are pairs. Each of these, the, these three pairs, are homonyms in Middle Chinese. Uh, gung, gung, wu, wu, gu, gu. Uh, but you see, we have decided to reconstruct them differently. And in this case, it's always a case of velar versus uh, uvular. And the reason for reconstructing the uvulars is that you have there are certain things that are typical of uvular uh, series, in our view, and you find those with the second one, but not with the first. Uh, so let's see. I think I have some more examples later. If not, I'll come back to that. This is another series, I was about to point this out, this, these are both yu, uh, this, one is, uh, this one is usually uh, shang shang yu, but uh, uh, this sentence final particle and this uh, are completely homonyms in Middle Chinese, and one is entitled to ask the question, 
uh, is this ever used to write this uh, sentence final particle? And if so, why not? Uh, well, for the later time, you can easily say, well, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to explain why, because if you wrote it with this, that would be wrong. And if you write it with this, that's correct, right? But then the question is, how, why did, where did that tradition come from? So we think this one is L and this one is a uvular. This is not a uvular case. This is, a, well, partly uvular, but it's also originally it's the main vowel, the rhyme, actually. Yuan uh, has a rounded vowel, even if, you know, and these two, are, yeah, these are complete homonyms in, uh, in uh, Middle Chinese. Uh, and you see we reconstruct them very differently. Nothing is the same. The, uh, the onset's not the same. One is rounded, one is not. The vowel's not the same. The codas are not the same. Uh, now, there is some, some uh, overlap here, uh, which I, this I had to mention in my book, and I had to worry about. It was a similar to the mun thing. So, for example, yuan, this yuan yi, the yuan, uh, rhymes as O-N, which is a problem because Yuan, uh, this one, rhymes as A-R. Well, I thought it rhymed as A-N, and now it's even diff more different, it rhymes as A-R. So what's going on here? Well, uh, actually, uh, this too is a late character. Uh, I think I can say that with confidence, and uh, let me see if it's coming up here. on the list, no, okay, if, if I look for characters with this element, oh, no, I, I, hang on just a second, I'll find you the other one, 61, one, two, three, four, it's, uh, it has uh, yuan, chao de yuan on top. I'm just not uh, seeing it. Maybe it's down below. Anybody see it? Hmm? No, it's not that. Uh -uh. I think it's down here in the, in the very obscure. Okay, so hang on. Here, no. Well, I, I won't, uh, uh, there's no point in, in troubling. What it, you do have yuan over xin, uh, and since uh, yuan is on, that character is perfectly uh, consistent with uh, reconstruction. Um, so again, we have basically the prediction that this character has to be a late character, because otherwise this phonetic represents r. I'm not quite sure how I got to that. I guess it was here, yeah. So, uh, actually, so the til over here we have an attempt to represent uh, the syllable type that, that each uh, phonetic uh, represents. This is something like la, but it could be type A, type B. This is a uvular plus A. Uh, could be several different u uvulars, although it doesn't seem to be the aspirated one ever. Uh, this one does have both nasals and non-nasals in the series, which is one of the criteria for uh, a uvular series anyway, right? Uh, we can get an, in, an ing initial from a uvular, but not by any regular process from a nasal. I mean from a velar, sorry. Uh, and then I mentioned this as well, fa, there are two fa phonetics. This uh, fa jan de fa, shoot, fa jan de fa and uh, this, the one that's in tofa de fa. Thanks for the name. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, this one means to set out, like uh, to send out, uh, like what you do to email, okay? And this is hair. Tofa, right, uh, shiver. And uh, so from a traditional point of view, these look like they're simply synonymous phonetics. Uh, there's no difference in Middle Chinese. But if you look at the rhymes, you will see that this one rhymes as A-T, and this one rhymes as O-T. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm still wondering about this syllable thing, and I, I just, I will try to explain what I'm saying. Okay. When I say phonetic, and you tell me where I'm, All right. what I'm doing wrong. 
because what what you I like the idea of phonetics because you see the script functioning in the same way all through this period of time and even now in bytes so people still write yeah. this phonetics and do the same thing. There's a tendency, you know, like I say, a tendency to undermine the official uh, script and just go ahead and write in some way that makes sense. Right? Absolutely. So if we look, you say that they work for about 1,000 phonetic elements, mm -hmm. but this is also approximately the number of possible syllables that you could have. No, it's the number of syllable types. Types. Right. Because okay. uh, because of the nature of the script already, you expect to have different manners of articulation in the initial consonant mm -hmm. because you had morpho different morphological forms from the same root that would be written with the same character. Okay, but I, 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 have, I was searching now, I thought it was for about 952 something told by Le Bon to us that there was a possible con number of combinations and some things were not occurring together, but this is for, for about what you could get based on your system. Well, I think he was talking about the actual number of, of uh, actual number of uh, syllables, not not the number of syllable types. Well, okay, let's say that, let's say actual number of syllables. Right. So you get approximately 1,000 different syllables, mm -hmm. and you have for about 1,000 phonetics, then you say phonetic elements in the old script, mm -hmm. and what is happening, and what is normal to happen in, in a script like Chinese, that people start using some elements to also know how it was pronounced, right. and since for each particular syllable there is a pool of possible words for which it can stand for, mm -hmm. some things were picked as standard for this particular syllable, mm -hmm. and as the time went by and some some connections were obscured, people were replacing them with the word showing the pizza morning for us right. also, by another phonetic. So the, the whole phonetic thing, I think, is working fine. I, I do not really... Well, the changes in the script that I've been referring to are all pre-Chin yeah. uh, changes, with the possible exception of Hua, the f word for flower. Um, and the, I mean, even if Qin Shui Huang wanted everybody to write exactly the same way, we know he didn't succeed. I mean, it, it, this didn't, this uniformity didn't get imposed right away. Mm -hmm. I suspect the uh, the examination system had uh, uh, yeah, an element in it. But in order for a system to function and to be understandable for others, you need to have some kind of consensus of what you use to mark a certain phonetic element. So it happened by itself. So it was a certain variation possible, and right. different scribes were using different things. Mm -hmm. But in order for you to understand what I'm writing, even mm -hmm. from a different tradition, we have to have some points in common. So mm -hmm. some things naturally rose as uh, possible common elements to mark a particular syllable. Right. And that was further on and unified by Tsim Shofang when he unified different traditions and set some uh, norms for the script. But it's basically, I just don't see how, that was my question, how, what, what is your improvement to this particular view on the Chinese script? Because this is already the idea which is, I think, is there. Um. Because, yeah, there are syllable types, there is a limit on the number mm -hmm. of possible syllables, and, well... Well, we are claiming that there will be a tendency not only to write with a, with a phonetic that's similar to the word that you're writing, mm -hmm. um, but um, also a tendency to stick to one phonetic for one particular syllable type, and if the, 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 the main difference then arises, I guess, from the uh, idea that one of the ways such a system would, in, would evolve is where there are two that seem to be interchangeable, the tradition might uh, decide on one rather than the other. So that uh, the main thing that we can do that the traditional view can't do, or the main, well, it's just the kind of question that we're prompted to ask is, why are there two different uh, phonetics to write this type of syllable? And why, uh, that could be easily explained and say, okay, no, they didn't care. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, somebody from the uh, more traditional point of view could say, well, that's just the way it is. There's some, they didn't always use one phonetic, one element for each type of syllable. But in that case, uh, we have to ask, 
why is it that this word, in, I mean, this, the words written with this phonetic and the words written with this phonetic uh, don't overlap? Or don't or overlap very little. We never see Changjiang to Jiang written with this, for example, as far as I know. But it's just because it will start with different initials. Well, I, we know that, but but that's the new part. No, but it's not the part of syllabary. It's a part of the reconstruction that you see the system differently, and you have a different number of syllable types in your reconstruction, which allows you to match the number of different phonetics. So these two things come together, and well. But this is basically the same thing, but that's what I'm trying to say. Oh, well, but I guess... Yeah. So there was a possible limit of what was possible for a syllable in that language. Mm -hmm. And for each type there was an element assigned, or there was a possible variation for everything. It doesn't need to say that it was a syllable, but it was one element chosen for each particular mm -hmm. syllable, and it was used conventionally by people to mark this particular pool of homonyms. Right. And uh, so it... Why, why necessarily was it a syllable? It just was the same phonetic used as the phonetic elements, just like in other character systems, okay. in other scripts. Well, um, I, I guess I, I keep coming back to this. Right. If uh, the question is, uh, uh, every reconstruction of Old Chinese until ours has reconstructed these two characters exactly the same way. Okay, they're absolutely homonyms in both. Uh, and uh, if people were using the script as you say, sort of picking a phonetic element, then th apart from just a, some kind of tradition of the way they were taught, uh, there's no reason to, ex these two should be equivalent. No, 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 but I'm saying exactly the same that you are saying, that there was a Regional distinction, which these two, this pair of different things was marking. So there was uh -huh. this particular initial and that particular initial. So uh -huh. there was the initial distinction in the language. There were so many syllables, uh -huh. and they matched it with so many different phonetics. Okay, well, no. Uh, uh, and then mm -hmm. later on, the, the, the thing got obscured. People started to, uh, whatever. These two phonetics right. became the more and more. Uh, homophonous, and then people started using different phonetics when it was not clear for them how it was pronounced. So there were different things happening, but the starting point is there was so many syllables in that language, and for each syllable there was one conventional element chosen, mm -hmm. and they were using it. Uh, um, well, what we're saying is not is not exactly that. Uh, uh, and just a second, uh, it's uh, actually uh, re what I said was that there are some syllables. Well, there's not necessarily an appropriate phonetic mm -hmm. because you simply may not have a, a syllable, uh, I mean a, a character, a graph available mm -hmm. uh, for a word with that shape. And so in some cases you have to uh, go rather far afield to, and use a phonetic which doesn't match as well as phonetics usually match. So that's the faute de mieux principle. So that's the, uh, the fact is that we would expect to find more variation in unusual syllable types than in ordinary syllable types. But would it be an unusual syllable type? Well, as I say, if you have a labioalveolar initial or labiouvular initial, labialized initial and a final M or a final P, uh, just by the luck of the draw, I mean, if you just uh, put them together, there are not many cases of that, right? And uh, because the M, the labial finals are rather few, and uh, well, the others not especially few. But I mean, different elements differ in the in their frequency. So some syllable types are going to be less frequent than other syllable types. But it's well, also natural in language, I'm not it's saying it's unnatural. Some certain things they are just more frequent than the others. So it's uh, I, I, I quite so agree. No, but it's, since it's natural in the language, mm -hmm. then the script is going to face this problem. Yeah. Either somebody has to sit down and, and find a w uniform way to represent every last syllable type, or they have to make use of what they already have and maximize it. What were you going to say? Not at all about referring to this uh, 
pronunciation of things in the language, mm -hmm. and how, how it is written. But I think that what they wanted to point out is probably the, the maybe new point of view about the Chinese script, but which may not appear so uh, revolutionary to us as it may be appear to others, mm. is that the traditional point of view that many people have taken about the Chinese script is that they work with one more thing to one character match all over the time, or one word to one character mm. match. And the new idea would then be that at that time when all these classics were written, and then mm. we uh, think mm. that what we have here preserved has that they have this specific character was this specific mm. word that it indeed was a time when people were still still to combine, you know, phonetic elements from the script with or not certain phonetic elements and to write according to what they were hearing, so to say, with a certain set of phonetic elements. Now the question is well, except that. Well, that I don't. I don't I'm not claiming that. I'm saying. I'm saying that it functioned in that. That that's the way it functioned. I mean. You know, Marx said men make their own history, but they don't make it just as they please, right? I mean, they had a certain traditional set of, of graphs, which were part of the system that they learned. And the question is, uh, how did they learn to match graphs against, uh, against words? And nowadays, you have to say, this is the graph for this word. And what we're saying in those days, if you were learning the script, basically you would be taught, this is the, the, gra this is the way you write a syllables that sound like this. That's a, basically all we're claiming. Did you have some? Yeah, yeah. And, and is this consistent from, say, the archival inscriptions on? So is this, um, um, yeah, phonetic inventory of syllables or um, the, the, these characters, are they just uh, from this time on sort of representing always the same? Um, no, because the language, I mean, pronunciation of the language is changing or may have already been different, so. Yeah, but The until change. There, until there is some sort of a convention, how to employ them. Well, I think there must be conventions at each stage as to how to employ them, but the but the content of the conventions changed. So, uh, you know, after a certain time, nowadays, if somebody was really writing Baidza and had absolutely no worries about whether it was the correct character or not, I think they would use these two interchangeably, pretty much, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but that's not what we see in the preaching script. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, going but, but then to what time? Going back to what time? Well, I think it, it must have basically, it, this, this was the, I mean, I haven't thought that much about the early evolution of the script, but, but I think uh, you don't have anything like the modern uh, script, uh, morphemic script, uh, morpheme-based script until uh, after the unification of the script, uh, you know, until the last 2,000 years. Before that, uh, it would be, would have been a system where you used uh, such and such a symbol for such and such a type of syllable. And of course, the symbol itself has a, usually has a meaning or it's a picture of yeah, something and I so forth. Agree. I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not saying it's purely phon uh, phonetic, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, as I say, I've I've stopped using. The, if I say anything, I say quasi syllabary rather than syllabary because, um, you know, uh, people uh, go through the roof uh, <laughs> because it's obviously not a syllabary in the sense that the kana of Japanese are a syllabary. Uh, it's not. It's obviously not that. 
Um, Right, right. Well, I think, for example, uh, in uh, if you find these, if you find a popular writing system, so I think uh, I don't know that much about the Nyu Shu in southern uh, Hunan, but this women's script, uh, local tradition of uh, of writing used only by women, uh, and the elements come from the Chinese script for the most part, as I understand it. But it has, it's a syllabary. Basically, you've got about 900 or something, I don't know how many different things, and it, it's a syllabary very much like the E syllabary. And so, if there were no pressure from the examination system and from the central government and all of that kind of stuff, we might expect Chinese to be written that way today. Uh, but the extraordinary centralization of, uh, of uh, China has brought it about that in spite of its difficulty and in spite of its obvious disadvantages, uh, we have a system where you have to memorize much more than you used to have to memorize. Of course, it has the advantage that now that uh, you can write and anybody from a whole, even in Japan and Vietnam can, could uh, read what you'd written. So it had the tremendous hist you know, historical advantage in, from that point of view. But Purely as a script, nobody would tolerate this <laughs> for very long uh, if that was the only consideration. Okay, so, um, I mean, if you look at these, yeah, uh, one way you tell them apart, this gung has a lot of words written with, uh, uh, which have glottal stop initials, like this uh, wung is a kind of, uh, uh, is it a, hmm? Well, there's a wong, yes, a, an old man, which I don't think occurs in, uh, pre, in early, very early texts, but uh, looks like it's probably related to gung, uh, might be from the same root. But you've also got wong, a kind of uh, a vessel, uh, and things like that. I'm trying to, somewhere I wrote, I can't find it now, but I, I had some more examples. Um, uh, Uh, so, one phonetic which does often seem to be interchanged with this gung is this, uh, this phonetic, okay? There are some words which are written with, uh, sometimes with one and sometimes with the other. Uh, now, I'm not excluding, uh, all I'm saying is that, uh, I'm not saying that that's impossible. Uh, all I'm saying is that there will be a tendency to settle on one way or the other for a particular uh, thing, but it may, may be a tendency that's local to one scribal tradition and a different scribal tradition might have settled on another. Uh, but in fact, I think this could very well be, originally have been a uh, uvular OM. Uh, we do have the, the, uv the labial coda syllables, as I said, seem to have uh, had a variety of developments and although most of the words here are, are pronounced uh, with final uh, velars now, velar nasal now, um, there, there's some reason to believe that this, uh, that the original value of this was with the final M rather than a, an ing. And that way, O-M to O-ing was, must have been one dialect development and we don't know where yet, so. Yes, sir? seems to be a case where three different phonetics have the same value uh, in, before your system. Uh, the yung and the gung and the gung? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there cases where more than two allegedly uh, homophonous? Well, I, I listed some. Uh, we had wu and wu. More than two or more than one? More than two. More than two. I think there must be. Uh, I haven't really sat down. I mean, this is a fairly new idea for us, so we haven't really... Uh, worked out the details, but uh, it, it seemed to make sense. And we did find that there were a lot of words which we thought were homonyms, which turn out, uh, you know, if you apply this uvular theory, they turn out not to be homonyms. They have different properties and uh, don't overlap that much. Uh, so I can't, well, yeah, sure. Uh, here's one, uh, a set, this wu, and this zhong wu de wu, and yu, fish. Okay, those three overlap to a large extent. Although I don't think fish is ever written with this. This seems to be type A, mostly. This is the uvular one. I think this really had a nasal, a, a velar nasal, and this had a velar nasal. 
But this is used to write the first person pronoun, for example. Uh, you do find that. So that's another three-way. Is it time? Okay, well, time for lunch.